Welcome to Enter the Unknown, your one-stop shop for answers to questions that you were never bored enough to ask. My name is FJ, and having made our way through Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, and Sinnoh with Ash's exact teams, we're now in Pokemon White to attempt the same in Unova. I know I mentioned last time out that Ash Ketchum really grew as a trainer between Kanto and Sinnoh, but I think somebody hit him on the head with a brick on the plane to Unova. There's an almost complete reset when Ash's plane lands at a pier near Nuvema Town. I think they wanted Silent and Iris to be the new Brock and Misty, which meant they needed Ash to be an inexperienced moron. That sounded harsh. They needed him to be a pea-brained pudding head. Thank you, Google. A wet behind the ears lame brain seemed to touch too far. Anyway, the point is they needed him to return to his original series ways to make the dynamic work. If Ash was constantly making idiotic decisions, then Iris could repeatedly call him a little kid and Silent could try to mold him into a better trainer. The regular rules apply, and even though the battle style wasn't on set for the first few gyms, I never made a change on an opponent's switch in. Honestly, I'm not sure how it took me so long to realise, but subconsciously I knew I wasn't allowed to make changes. Also, just to quickly explain the set battle style, because I seem to get comments about it on every video. It stops me from switching out when my opponent is making a change, so I can't easily get the upper hand in battle, but I'm allowed to switch out normally just like Ash does in his gym battles. Okay, as always, we're not using items in battle or held items, aside from one obvious exception, and I think that's all we need to cover. Let's get into the video. When Ash reaches Nuvema Town, he's only got Pikachu in tow. The electric type gets badly injured quickly, but that's not important because he'll be fine before the first important battle. Pikachu knows Quick Attack, Thunderbolt, Iron Tail, and Volt Tackle at this point, so that's the moveset we're going with, but as we've done in every new region, levels have been reset. As the Pokemon protagonist makes his way out into Route 1, he encounters a P-Dove who he's keen on adding to his team. Pikachu hits the normal flying type with a Quick Attack, an Iron Tail, and a Thunderbolt, knocking her out and making it a nice, easy catch for Ash. P-Dove knows Gust, Quick Attack, and Air Cutter when she makes her debut, so that's the moveset we're going with for starters. Also on Route 1, the Oshawott from Professor Juniper's lab, who's been following Ash, finally comes face to face with him. After Ash attempts to catch the water starter, he realises that the Pokemon already has a Pokeball. Professor Juniper sends it over, and just like that, we've got a team of three. The Sea Otter Pokemon only uses Water Gun prior to joining Ash's team, so that's how we're starting. Having added a couple of team members on the first route of the Unova region, Ash makes his way into Accumula Town. Once there, we basically relive the Charmander edition from Kanto. A complete bastard leaves his Fire-type starter to die for some reason, and Ash comes across the dying Pokemon and saves it. Why can't anyone in this series treat a Fire-type starter Pokemon properly? Anyway, Tepic is full of appreciation for the help, and joins Ash's team, making it a quartet before even reaching the first gym. The only move that we see Tepic use in his first appearance is Ember, so that's how we're setting up. Okay, we're finally ready to head into Striden City and take on the first gym. Unova's first gym has three different potential leaders, and instead of taking on one, Ash decides to face off against all three. That makes things terribly inconvenient for me, but I really don't think he cares about how his decisions affect me. Up first is the Fire-type trainer, Chili. Of course, with Oshawott and his team, it's an easy choice to send in... Tepig. He just does not care at all. Alright, let's have a quick look. For our first run at the Striton City Gym, we're using just our level 13 Tepig with Ember and Tackle. All we really know about his level is that he hadn't quite learned Flame Charge yet, so he's under 15, which makes 13 as good as any. Okay, let's give this a go. Chili leads off with Lillipup, which is a game exclusive and makes our job a little harder. Luckily, the Striden City Gym Leaders are obsessed with the move Work Up, so while Tepig trots around the battlefield sending Ember after Ember in Lillipup's direction, the puppy Pokemon focuses entirely on raising his attack and special attack. Although he gets in close enough to bite Tepig once, the Fire Pig takes him out pretty easily. Chili sends in Panseer next, and Tepic switches up the game plan attacking with Tackle instead of Ember. The Gym Leader's Ace only manages to respond with Incinerate, and in the end, it's another simple task for Tepic. This was a whole lot easier than I thought it would be. Anyway, Cress is up next. Against the Water-type member of the Striton City Trio, Ash selects Pikachu, which is an almost shockingly sensible decision. Ironically, he actually loses this one, but let's ignore that. We're going in with the electric type at level 12, and the moves Quick Attack, Thunderbolt, Iron Tail, and Volt Tackle. Okay, this one shouldn't be too hard, let's get into it. Lillipup is up first for Crest 2. Pikachu really doesn't have anything to worry about against the second brother, who's even more taken by the TM for workup. Lillipup doesn't even attempt an attack, and when Panpour comes in, it's more of the same. A couple of Thunderbolts take down the second elemental monkey, giving us another win in our search for gym badge number 1. The final of the three Strife and City gym battles sees Ash facing off his soon-to-be travelling companion, Silent. This is the decider, so obviously Ash picks Oshawott to go up against Pansage. 
This is the battle in which Ash's Oshawott uses Razor Shell for the first time, so seeing as he learns that at level 17, we're going in at that level with Water Gun and Tackle accompanied by his new move. This will probably be the toughest yet, but Ash only won two of the three, so maybe it's not important. Like his brother, Silent leads off with his Lily Pup, but unlike his brothers, he doesn't get to show off any moves. Oshawott cracks the normal type with Razor Shell, slamming him into the ground and knocking him out in one. When Silent sends in Pan Sage, the Water Starter attacks again with another piece of Scalchop based offense. It deals a decent chunk of damage, but as the Brothers Camareros are clearly being paid to advertise the technical machine for workup, Silent instructs Pan Sage to go for that instead of a super effective hit. Another Razor Shell leaves the Grass Monkey severely injured, but just about still standing. As a defensive measure more than anything, Pansage attacks with Vine Whip, giving Silent just enough time to spray a potion and heal him up a bit. It briefly saves him, but another strike from Razor Shell leaves Pansage on the brink of fainting once again. Too tired to move or defend himself, the Elemental Monkey is clubbed by another Razor Shell attack, finishing him off and handing us our third win, good enough to earn the trio patch. As a free sample to get us hooked, the brothers hand over a workup TM, and with that, we're on our way. Leaving Stryas and City behind, we venture out onto Route 3 where Ash, unsatisfied with only 4 Pokemon, goes on the hunt for something new. The Snivy he finds there is too much for Tepig, using a track to render him useless in battle. P-Dove is unaffected by Snivy's charms though and is able to weaken the grass starter enough for Ash to catch her. After letting May, Brock and Dawn bear some of the burden in Hoenn and Sinnoh, Ash is back to getting all of the starters for himself. In her first ever appearance, Ash's Snivy uses the moves Vine Whip, Attract, and Leaf Storm, so that's going to be her starting moveset for us. In the game, Snivy doesn't learn Leaf Storm until level 43, so to keep things from getting too ridiculous, we're just going to assume that she figured that one out early. Also on Route 3, Ash helps out a group of students and their teacher with some trash-related problems they're having. As a reward for all of his help, Ash is presented with a Pokemon Egg, taking up the final spot on his roster and giving us a full party before even reaching the second gym. Speaking of, once he reaches Nacreen City, Ash challenges Lenora to a battle and selects the team of Tepig and Oshawott to take her on. It's tough to pick a bad team against a normal type gym leader, so he's done an okay job here. As far as levels go, we've got Tepig at level 15 with his new move Flame Charge, which makes sense with that being the battle where he uses it for the first time. We had to take some leeway with Oshawott though. In this battle, the water type uses Aqua Jet, which he should learn at level 29, but that's super over leveled, so we're going in at level 20 instead, on par with Lenora's Ace. Alright, our movesets are anime accurate and our levels are questionable, so let's give this a go. Lenore leads off with her herd ear and we send in Tepig to start. After the fire type's attack is lowered by Intimidate, we switch straight out to Oshawa. Herd ear rams into the water type with a powerful takedown that was aimed for Tepig. The rampaging normal type sends Oshawa slamming into the wall of the gym, crashing in behind after the out of control hit. Both Pokemon are damaged, but Oshawa recovers quicker, standing up and striking with Razor Shell. Another wild takedown leaves both Oshawott and Herdier incredibly weak. The Sea Otter Pokemon's powers of recovery are once again superior though. Lenora's Super Potion stops Aqua Jet from finishing off Herdier, but with the dog completely focused on healing up, there's no chance for her to defend against another slashing Skull Chop. Razor Shell hits one last time, knocking out Herdier and taking Lenora down to one. When she sends in Watchog, the weakened Oshawott is already close to fainting. One final Aqua Jet is too quick to prevent though. Watchog is slammed by the water type, but reacting promptly, she catches Oshawott and crunches down, wiping out any remaining HP. Tepig returns to the battle, but the fully evolved Watchog is much faster. Retaliate hits the Fire Pig hard, but Flame Charge doesn't go unnoticed. The Fiery Hit also boosts Tepig's speed, who's now ready to attack again. A second Flame Charge definitely registers with Watchog, who attacks with Retaliate again, but can't quite score a knockout. On his last legs, but still feeling the speed boost, Tepig charges once more, slamming into Watchog, knocking her out and earning us another win. Lenora hands over the basic badge, and after a hard-fought battle, we're slowly but surely making our way through the Unova gyms. On our way out of Nacreen City, the egg we received earlier begins to hatch, and in no time we have a brand new team member in the shape of Scraggy. The Dark and Fighting type only knows Headbutt and Leer when he emerges from the egg, so that's our starting point. Now that we've got a full team of six after like two gyms, I'm sure Ash is going to relax and slow down on the whole Pokemon catching thing. Or not! Inside Pinwheel Forest, Ash encounters a Suwaddle and decides to add him to the rapidly growing team. For the first time, the Pokemon we're adding starts out with a full moveset knowing Tackle, String Shot, Bug Bite, and Razor Leaf as of his debut. It's not really made clear who gets dropped from the team here, but someone must because we've got seven Pokemon now. That doesn't sit right with Pikachu who's tired of being pushed from the spotlight and decides to learn a new move, Electro Ball. That means we've seen the last of Vault Tackle, which is sad, but Electro Ball looks pretty cool, so at least there's that. Okay, we're almost at the next battle. 
The final major occurrence before Ash takes on Berg in Castellia City is the evolution of P-Dove. You've only had a brief glimpse of the flying type since we caught her and already she's evolving. They grow up so fast. I don't really remember what happened here, so let's just say there were some Venipede and probably Trip 2. That sounds right, let's go with that. Okay, on to gym battle number 3. Against Berg, Ash uses the team of Tepig, Swaddle, who evolves mid-battle into Swadloon, and Pikachu. This does make gauging Swaddle's level easy at least. The Bug and Grass type is at level 19, right on the cusp of 20. If I'm doing my job right, then he'll be evolving when this one's over. Pikachu and Tepic are also at level 19 and their movesets are unchanged from the last time you saw them, so with that, let's get going. The Castellia City Gym Leader sends in his Whirlipede first, and we start out with Sawaddle. This is really just a ploy to get him up to level 20 though, so we immediately switch out to Pikachu who's struck by a Poison Tail that was aiming for Sawaddle. The Electric Mask illuminates the entire battlefield with a Thunderbolt that hits the target square and leaves him paralyzed with only a single hit point remaining. Burr keeps Whirlipede rolling with a Hyper Potion that heals up the Bug and Poison type before Pikachu can hit with Quick Attack. The Electric type then follows up with a Thunderbolt, but Whirlipede counters with another Poison Tail. In the end, the Paralysis is just too much for Burr's first Pokemon. Pikachu sends a final Thunderbolt straight into Whirlipede, knocking him out and giving us the first win of the match. Burr sends in Dwebble next, and Pikachu dashes in close and flips forward, cracking the Crustacean's rocky shell with Iron Tail. Getting too close is a serious error though. The rock layeth the smacketh down on Pikachu, leaving him out for the count and leveling things up at 2-2. We go back out to Swaddle next, and after a back and forth matchup, Dwebble gets the better of him thanks largely to another Hyper Potion from Berg. Smackdown scores the Hermit another knockout, taking us down to only Tepig. By the time the Fire Pig comes in, Dwebble has been massively weakened by Pikachu and Swaddle, so a single Ember finishes him off, taking Berg down to his final Pokemon. Livani comes in last and outspeeds Tepig to connect with Razor Leaf, but even with a critical hit, it's not too damaging. That basically seals Berg's fate. When Tepig charges Livani down, it not only critically injures the nurturing Pokemon, but raises Tepig's speed too. Although a Protect extends the battle by a turn, that's all it is. A final Flame Charge hands us the win, and to be 100% accurate, we get to see Sawaddle evolving at the end of the battle. Alright, with three badges in hand, we can leave Castellia and head out onto Route 4. That's where Ash finds his next team member, Palpitoad. After a battle with Oshawott, he catches the Water Ground type, taking his unit of a team up to 8. The Vibration Pokemon knows Hydro Pump, Supersonic, and Mudshot when Ash finds him, so that's our moveset for starters. Having 8 Pokemon makes selecting our team a little more difficult, so Ash helps out by catching another Pokemon to make it a nice clean 9. Rock and Roll is also on Route 4, and after a hard hitting clash with Tepic, the Mantle Pokemon is caught. Unit of Ash Ketchum is really a whole new beast. Okay, let's look at Rock and Roll's moveset. Starting out with Stone Edge, Sandstorm, and Flash Cannon, we're in pretty good shape from the off. Thankfully, seeing we're in too good of shape, Ash makes sure to forget Stone Edge before too long. Alright, that's everything Ash accomplishes between Castellia and Nimbasa, so let's check out the next gym battle. Ash chooses the team of Palpitoad, Snivy, and Pikachu against Elisa's Electric type trio, which is actually another very solid team. I guess Silence teachings and Iris's insults are helping Ash to start to improve. Also, at this point, my brain booted into gear and I realized that I hadn't confirmed the fast tech speed or the set battle style. I was ready to start the game over, but looking back, I realized that I'd never switched out when I wasn't allowed to, so we can just push on knowing that it'll look right from here on out. Our three team members are all at level 26 here, but the only new move I have to show you is Snivy's Leaf Blade. Other than that, we're the same across the board. We start off with Pikachu facing off against Elisa's Amolga. The Sky Squirrel Pokemon is a great counter for ground type Pokemon, but Elisa really hasn't planned for how to deal with fellow electric types. The partial flying typing means that Amolga doesn't resist Thunderbolt, and without many useful attacks, Elisa's first Pokemon goes down incredibly quickly. Zeb Strike is up next for the Nimbasa City Gym Leader, so we recall Pikachu and send in Palpitoad. The Electric Zebra strikes quickly and repeatedly tries to overpower the Water Ground type with his physicality. Palpitoad keeps plugging along though, encountering with Mudshot, and in the end, the super effective stab moves make all the difference. That leaves only Elisa's second Amolga. When she's sent in, she strikes the weakened Palpitoad quickly and takes it down to a 2 on 1, but it's still a pretty hopeless situation. We bring in Pikachu again, and things go from bad to worse for Elisa when Amolga's paralyzed by static. The Electric Mouse strikes twice with Thunderbolt, finishing off Elisa and earning us the Bolt Badge. That's it for Nimbasa City, and in fact, it's the last major thing that happens before Ash takes on Clay, so let's get right into the next battle. Driftvale's gym leader has to face off against Oshawott, Snivy, and Rock'n'Rolla, which is an okay team for this one. 
The rock type actually ends up evolving into Baldor mid-battle, so we've got another evolution to manufacture, which is really just an extra task for us. Three unevolved Pokemon isn't ideal against a region's fifth gym leader, but we've at least got some good typings to use. Our movesets are unchanged from the last time you saw them, and we've got Rock and Roll at level 24, with Oshawott and Snivy up at level 30. This one could be tough, let's give it a go. I must say, I love the idea of Risk Reward. Taking that dangerous leap in the hopes that it'll pay off extra when you land. Most drivable par 4s in golf represent it perfectly. American football's two-point conversion and onside kick do the same. Things are so much more exciting when both potential outcomes are more drastic. The move Swagger is Pokemon's representation of Risk Reward. You raise your opponent's attack by two stages while simultaneously confusing them. If they hit themselves in confusion, then they'll be inflicting twice as much damage to themselves due to the raised attack stat. If they attack with a physical hit and break through confusion, however, you've made things doubly bad for yourself. Clay played the game, and he lost. Not only does Swagger allow Rock and Roller to decimate Crocorock, but thanks to Sturdy, Palpito takes a big hit too. Bubble Beam finishes off the Rock type eventually, but he's made Snivy's job easy. She slices Palpitoad with Leaf Blade and takes it down to a 2 on 1. Clay's Excadrill comes out last, and with the power of sheer intimidation on his side, he flinches Snivy out of existence. The Grass Starter is crushed under mountains of rocks without ever composing herself for long enough to fight back. Now we're down to just one. When Oshawott comes in, Excadrill sprays sparks across the field, sharpening his claws, but it doesn't ward off the Sea Otter Pokemon. A single Razor Shell deals serious damage to Clay's Ace, who retaliates with a dangerous slash that leaves Oshawott weak. Before Excadrill can finish him off though, a second slice of his Scowl Chop takes down the ground and Steel type, handing us another win. Of course, for the sake of accuracy, the end of the battle sees Rock and Roller evolving into Baldor. Quake Badge in hand, we can head out of Driftvale City and onwards to Route 6. It's here that we can finally end a year-long game of Cat and Mouse. After coming across a bespectacled Sandile in just the third episode of the Best Wishes series, Ash didn't end up adding the ground type to his team until episode 65. Sandile evolved in the meantime, so team member number 10, who will be our final Unova edition, is Crocorock. I know it's against the rules I set to use held items, but it would be wrong if I didn't let Crocorock wear his glasses. The Desert Croc is hiding behind black glasses at level 32, with the moves Dig, Bite, Stone Edge, and Crunch. Okay, our roster of Pokemon has officially been filled up, so let's get to Miss Charlton City and go after the next gym badge. Against Skylar, Ash chooses to use the trio of Crocorock, Tranquil, and Pikachu. This is a unit of a gym battle though, so by the end of it, Tranquil has evolved and we've got a brand new one, Pheasant. That makes it three evolutions in the last four gym battles. Ash's team really got psyched up for the big matchups. Tranquil's Aerial Ace is the only new move in our lineup, and we're going into this one with a couple of level 31s and a level 32. We're a little underleveled, but I'm pretty confident. Let's get into it. Skyla sends out Swoobat first, and we go in with Tranquil. As we've done repeatedly now though, we start by switching out immediately. Crocorock comes in on our side, and when Swoobat doesn't attack after the switch, the Croc capitalizes, leaping into the air and crunching down. A single super effective crunch knocks out Swoobat, giving us the early advantage. Skyla goes for Swanna next, and even though we've got Pikachu waiting in the wings, and Crocorock's weak to water, I decided to stick with him. Skyla instructs Swanna to start by setting up Aqua Ring instead of attacking with Bubble Beam. This was not a good move. Crocorock sees his opportunity and fires a Stone Edge straight into the Flying type that crits her and scores him another one shot. That leaves Skyla with only her own Pheasant, and after sending a Stone Edge wide of the mark, we recall Crocorock in favour of Pikachu. The Electric Mouse seemed destined to shine here, but in just a couple of hits, Unpheasant takes him down without being hit at all. That means Crocorock is back in charge, and he really isn't going to make any mistakes. The two moves that scuppered Skyla's chances by destroying her first two Pokemon combined to cut down Unpheasant and hand us another win. At the end of the battle, Crocorock stands tall, having decimated Skyla's entire team. Not a bad debut appearance. Okay, as you know, Tranquil evolves in the background, having really contributed nothing at all, and Skyla hands over the Jet Badge, meaning we now have 6 of the 8 available in Unova. In a practice battle that we'll see a little more of later, Ash's Swadloon evolves into Levani. So, we've gone from no fully evolved Pokemon to 2 in like 30 seconds, that's pretty promising. Another major evolution occurs before Ash reaches Isora City. Tepic's original trainer, you know, the one who tied him up and left him for dead, yeah, that guy. His name is Seamus. He spells Seamus massively incorrectly, has no trace of an Irish accent, and despite being a fire-type specialist, doesn't have flaming red hair, so we're not taking credit for him. Anyway, he's the worst. Possibly worse than Damien, which is also kind of a common name here. God damn it. 
It's basically rule one of the Pokemon anime that if Ash is going to catch the Firestarter in any given region, it has to have had a traumatic past. I'm so off track. Tepic evolves, that's the point. Seamus offers Pignite a place on his team because again, he's just Damien really, but obviously the Fire Pig rejects him, and with that, we can move on. For his matchup against the Icerous City Gym Leader, Ash chooses the team of Crocorock, Scraggy, and Pignite. That's another pretty good team selection. This is starting to get suspicious, I think somebody else is picking his teams for him. Our whole team's at level 34 for this one, and we actually have a few new moves to report. Scraggy has learned High Jump Kick and Focus Blast, and Pignite has added Fire Pledge to his moveset. Okay, let's go. Number 7 on the way. Hopefully. The battle begins with Bryson's Vanillish facing off against Scraggy. The gym leader calls for Acid Armor, which sharply raises the Ice Cream's defense and ends up keeping him in the match. Scraggy springs into the air and kicks Vanillish full on in the face. The attack leaves the Ice type with a single hit point remaining, so Bryson sprays him with a Hyper Potion, which does its job. It also means that Vanillish is forced to take another powerful high jump kick, leaving him battered and broken yet again. Another Hyper Potion, another High Jump Kick. This just feels cruel now. For the third time, Vanillish has been taken from full health to the cusp of unconsciousness. It isn't just cruel, it's torturous. The weakened Icy Snow Pokemon manages to summon the energy to attack once, and mercifully, Scraggy uses Headbutt to put him out of his misery. Moxie raises the Dark and Fighting type's attack before Beartick comes in and sends things into overdrive with Swagger. Bryson's really playing with fire now. That doesn't seem like a great decision for an Ice-type gym leader, but his gamble pays off, unlike Clay's earlier. Scraggy hits himself in confusion, dealing some serious damage, and Beartick can easily finish him off with Icicle Crash. We bring in Crocorock next, and although he's able to badly injure Beartick, the Ice-type eventually takes advantage of his super effective moves. Pignite comes in last and finishes off the struggling bear with Flamethrower, taking it down to a one-on-one. -on -one. Cryogonal's outlast for Bryson, and although it strikes first with Aurora Beam, it's not enough. Pignite charges headlong into the ice type, engulfed in flames, and knocks him out in a single hit. That earns us the freeze badge, and now we only need one more. Well, kind of. In the Best Wishes series, Ash takes on Roxy in Veerbank City to earn his final gym badge. That doesn't really work out here because the only two final gym leader options in black and white are Drayden and Iris. So, we're gonna be jumping over to Pokemon White 2 for a second. After using his Pokedex to identify Coughing, who he's seen half a million times, Ash chooses to use Boldor, Unfezzam, Livani, Pignite, Palpitoad, and Pikachu. At this point, Boldor has added Rock Blast and Rock Smash, and Livani has learned Energy Ball, but other than that, our movesets are unchanged. We're possibly a little overleveled for White 2's second gym, but this is just how things have to be. Okay, let's get into it. This took longer than necessary, but I wanted to use every team member, so after Boldor and Unpheasant combined to take down Coughing, we let Livani, Pignite, Palpitoad, and Pikachu work together to pick off Whirlipede. That earns us the Toxic Badge, but we've still got to take on somebody in Opelucid City. I opted for Pokemon White because even though Drayden is the Opelucid City gym leader in the anime, we have no records for battles between him and Ash. Iris, on the other hand, has taken on the Pokemon protagonist on a number of occasions. We got to see Axew vs Scraggy, Pikachu vs Excadrill, Swadloon vs Amolga in the battle where Swadloon evolved, and Crocorock vs Dragonite in the matchup where Ash got Crocodile. So, we're going to be using the team of Scraggy, Pikachu, Livani, and Crocorock against Iris with the goal of getting Crocorock to evolve. Our movesets are completely unchanged from the last time you saw them, and seeing as we have a one Pokemon advantage, we're going in a little underleveled. Okay, for the final, and weirdly the ninth time, let's get into this gym battle. Iris leads off with her Fracture, and we start out with Scraggy. The fighting type has been surprisingly useful in this run so far, and after Fracture's Dragon Dance, he comes up trumps again. A crit high jump kick obliterates the dragon, and with the Moxie boost and full health, we're in great shape. Drudigan's up next for Iris, and even with the Gym Leader using a Hyper Potion, Scraggy easily dispatches of the dragon without losing too much health. The Moxie boost raises Scraggy's attack again, and when Haxorus comes in, a powerful kick sends him flying backwards. The Axe Jaw Pokemon has barely any hit points remaining, but he's able to counter with Dragon Tail, which badly hurts Scraggy and forces a switch out to Pikachu. We really need to get Crocorock some experience, so we switch out again, but Iris takes the opportunity to use a Hyper Potion. The Ground type still manages to overcome the powerful dragon using Crunch, earning the experience to evolve in the process. Of course, it also forces Iris to hand over the Legend Badge too, so now we've got an overflowing badge case. There's nothing left to do but head for the Elite Four. Similar to the Hoenn region, only one Elite Four member appears in the anime, that being Caitlyn. Another similarity between the two regions as it relates to the Pokemon League is that once again, Ash chooses to only use the Pokemon that he caught during his journey there. 
although we only see one Elite Four member, N and Getsis do both make appearances. Once again though, we don't get any battles, so instead I'm coming up with custom teams that it seems likely Ash would have picked. Each of the Elite Four members uses a team of four, and we have ten Pokemon to choose from, so we're going to be using six of our roster twice, and the other four once each. We're never going to choose the best team, because that doesn't seem very much like Ash, but we'll pick a decent side for each matchup. Chantal's up first, and for this one we're going with a team of Pikachu, Pignite, Snivy, and Crocodile. Pignite's Brick Break and Crocodile's Dragon Claw are both new moves, and we're going in at level 45 across the board. I think that's about all you need to know. Alright, let's get started here. The Ghost-type member of the Elite Four leads off with Cofagrigus, and we send out Pikachu first. The Electric Mouse manages to deal significant damage with a couple of Thunderbolts, but the Coffin Pokemon overpowers him and gives Chantal the first win of the match with Psychic. We send in Crocodile next, but Chantal sends us back to square one using a full restore on her leadoff Pokemon. That does just enough as Crocodile's Crunch leaves Cofagrigus deep into red health. Another full restore is met by another Crunch that gets the job done at the second time of asking. That ties the match at 3-3 and when Chantal sends in Jellicent, we switch out Crocodile for Snivy. Although it was aimed for the ground type and it's not very effective, Jellicent Surf still hurts the grass starter. The Leaf Storm that she whips up is far more potent though. Jellicent's in pain but manages to fire a Shadow Ball that clips Snivy leaving her with just a handful of hit points remaining. On her last leg, Snivy darts in close and slashes Jellicent with Leaf Blade, knocking her out and giving us the advantage. Although it ends up being incredibly brief. Before she can even ready herself for an attack, Snivy is struck down by a Shadow Ball from Chantal's third Pokemon, Chandelure. We send Crocodile back into battle and he quickly catches the ghost with Crunch. It's an easy one-shot meaning Chantal's down to one. She sends out Golurk and we swap in Pignite to give him a chance in the battle. Earthquake puts a swift end to any grand plans the Fire Pig had though, and just like that we're in a one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, back to Crocodile. Crunch does its job yet again, acting like a straight-up Oko move, and without too many issues, we've made it past the first Elite Four member. Grimsley is up next, and it felt like a real Ash move to switch out three team members but keep Pikachu in the side. That means he's all done for the Elite Four after this. We've added Livani, Oshawott, and Scraggy for this one, and both X's are in Hydro Pump are new moves. Also, we're level 45 across the board once again. That was the level that all ten of our Pokemon were at coming into the Elite Four. Okay, this team's probably a little weaker than our last, but let's get into it. Grimsley sends in his Scrafty first, and we lead off with Livani. Although there's poison pumping through his stems by the end of the face-off, Livani comes out the winner with the help of the newly learned X-Scissor. Grimsley's second Pokemon, Lipard, makes sure that advantage is short-lived, though. A quad effective Aerial Ace quickly cuts down Livani to tie up the match. We bring in Pikachu next, who outspeeds the Dark-type to connect with Thunderbolt before she tries to confuse things with Attract. Never has there been a Pokemon more focused on battling, though. Pikachu ignores the infatuation and sends another bolt of pure electricity crashing into Lipard, giving us another win. Crocodile's up next for Grimsley, and we've learned firsthand just how powerful the Desert Croc can be. Pikachu swings at fresh air with Iron Tail, but Crocodile is more precise, clamping down on the Electric Mouse with Crunch. Like Chantal before us, we have to bear witness to a Crocodile one-shot and hope our next team member can do better. We send in Oshawott, who's immediately thrown across the battlefield by a destructive earthquake. Seriously shaken but still ready to fight, Oshawott steadies himself and fires a Hydro Pump right at Crocodile. The critical hit obliterates the Intimidation Pokemon, and when Grimsley sends in Bisharp, Oshawott's last defiant action is to hit with Aqua Jet. It doesn't do much, and an Aerial Ace finishes off the Water Starter, but each of our team members has taken down one opponent. Now, it's Scraggy's turn. Grimsley's Ace strikes first with another Aerial Ace, but this time it's super effective. Scraggy isn't going down without a fight, though. Surviving through the strike, Scraggy leaps at Bisharp and spins her head with a high jump kick, destroying her in a single blow. Grimsley is defeated, and we've taken down half of the Elite Four. This battle was much more of a team effort, though. Caitlyn's up third, and we're going to bring Crocodile back into the fold for this one. The remainder of our team will be made up of Boldor and Pheasant and Palpatode, meaning all of our roster have now made an appearance in the Elite Four. Only Pikachu and Crocodile are going to be off the table for our final battle against Marshall. Palpatode added Sludge Wave in the time since you last saw him, but other than that we're unchanged. Alright, this one shouldn't take long. Honestly, the supporting trio were sort of unnecessary here. Crocodile's Crunch is very much the story of the Elite Four so far. Reuniclus, Sigilyph, and Musharna are all powerless to stop it, but I felt bad for not giving the rest of the team a try, so gave each of them a shot at Gothitelle. Unpheasant, Boldor, and Palpatode really aren't up to much here, though. 
Each of the three are taken down by Caitlyn's ace and she must briefly think she's about to pull off a miraculous comeback. Crocodile returns to battle though and Crunch is once again the game winner, handing us yet another win. Caitlyn returns to her bed to have some crocodilian nightmares and we stride onwards to the last Elite Four member. Against Marshall we choose to use Unpheasant, Boldor, Levani and Pig Knight. Only Levani has really seen any battle time during the Elite Four, so even though they're each making their second outing, it's really just another opportunity to make a good impression. We haven't added any new moves, so without further ado, let's get into the final Elite Four contest. Marshall leads off with Throw, and we send in Unpheasant first. The Flying type uses her speed to strike first with Aerial Ace, and the super effective hit takes Throw down in one. Sork's out next, and even though Marshall breaks out two full restores, Unpheasant eventually gets the better of the Fighting type. Two Pokemon down, and with Unpheasant dodging Stone Edge, we haven't even taken a single hit. Conkeldur makes more of his opportunity, though. When Aerial Ace doesn't take him down, Conkeldur fires a Stone Edge at Unpheasant, and this time it connects. Luckily, Unpheasant manages to just survive the hit and fires back another Aerial Ace that knocks out Conkeldur and takes Marshall down to one. Mien Xiao's up next, but not wanting to lose Unpheasant, we switch out to Boldor. The Rock type goes down in a couple of hits without attacking, so not the most helpful appearance. Pig Knight's up next, and he does at least manage to slam into Mian Xiao with Flame Charge before being knocked out. Levani comes out next, and is immediately one-shotted by Rock Slide, so we're back down to Justin Pheasant, who has only 7 hit points remaining. Mian Xiao's incredibly quick, and if he outspeeds on Pheasant, then we lose. Luckily, and Pheasant's speed is superior, and she strikes first with Aerial Ace, knocking out Mian Xiao and handing us the win. That was about as close as the battle can get, but we've actually managed to defeat all of the Elite Four members. Ends up next, and seeing as he's got a full team, we're bringing in six of our best. We're going to be using Palpatode, Levani, Pig Knight, Crocodile, Pikachu, and Boldor. We're underleveled and outclassed, but we do have Crocodile, so anything's possible. N sends out Reshiram first, and we lead off with Palpatode, so it's a pretty even matchup. Fusion Flare is incredibly powerful, but Palpatode's resistances mean he's not too badly hurt. The Ward Ground type fires back with Mudshot, which lowers Reshiram's speed, allowing a second Mudshot to land too. N isn't going to let Palpito take down Reshiram though, and calls for Hyper Beam. The Vibration Pokemon is sent flying into a nearby pillar, knocking him out and giving N the early lead. We send in Crocodile, and thanks to Mudshot lowering Reshiram's speed, the Desert Croc is able to strike first with Dragon Claw. That knocks out the Legendary Dragon and levels up the match. Vanillox is up next for N, so with Crocodile's Ice Weakness, we switch out to Pig Knight. The Fire Pig resists all of the Ice Cream's attacks, so a couple of hits of Brick Break get us a knockout, but our advantage lasts about as long as N's did. Caracosta comes in and slams into Pig Knight with Aqua Jet, which levels things up at 4 to 4. Livani sent in and strikes fast with a quad effective Razor Leaf, but Caracosta's high defense keeps him in it. The Proto Turtle's Stone Edge is too powerful for Livani to withstand, though. It wipes out the bug in one, giving N the lead yet again. The roller coaster of a battle continues when Pikachu comes in and finishes off Caracos to a Thunderbolt. Of course, if any Pokemon was going to turn the tide in a challenge based on the anime, it would be Pikachu. The Electric Mouse is the first Pokemon to score consecutive knockouts in battle when he takes down Kling Clang with Thunderbolt. N sends in Zoroark next, and after getting hit by Thunderbolt, he takes down Pikachu with Night Slash, but in striking, he's paralyzed by Static. Crookdial comes back in and digs straight underground, preparing to hit with Dig. Zorok fires a Focus Blast and misses before Crocodile emerges and slams into the Dark type, taking N down to 1. Archeops is up last, and although Acrobatics leaves Crocodile feeling weak, Crunch takes the Rock and Flying type below half health. That kicks Archeops' ability into effect. Defeatist halves Archeops' attack and special attack when his HP falls below half. That means the second hit of Archeops' Acrobatics is just lacking the power to take out Crocodile, so with two hit points remaining, he catches the bird with Crunch, taking him down and handing us the win. Okay, that leaves us with just a single opponent remaining. Getsis has a seriously powerful team, so after getting the whole group up to level 50 and swapping out Palpatode and Boldor for Scraggy and Unpheasant, we're ready for one last battle. With Alder, Sharon, and N looking on, we get the battle going with Crocodile and Cofagrigus. Darting in close, the Intimidation Pokemon chomps down on the coffin, which seems unpleasant, but it's effective nonetheless. Cofagrigus is weak, but fires back with Toxic, which badly poisons Crocodile. Getsis combines a full restore and protect to stall us long enough that Toxic starts to deal some decent damage, but eventually we come out on top. When Getsis sends in Hydreigon, we need to recall Crocodile before Toxic finishes him off. We send in Unpheasant, who uses her speed to dodge Hydreigon's Focus Blast, but the Dragon readies himself again and fires off a Dragon Pulse that finds the mark. 
Shockingly enough, and Pheasant actually survives the attack and takes full advantage of the opportunity that provides. A critical hit on Aerialis takes Hydreigon below half health before a fire blast cremates the bird. We go out to Pikachu next, who's probably our only chance to outspeed Hydreigon. We go for Thunderbolt, hoping not for big damage, but to paralyze the dragon so another team member can get the job done. We don't get the paralysis I was hoping for, and Focus Blast obliterates Pikachu, so now we're back in big trouble. Pig Knight's our next option, and another surprise, the Fire Pig doesn't go down to Hydreigon Surf. Deep into red health, Pig Knight strikes Hydreigon's central head with Brick Break, finally taking him down and getting us back into the battle. Although we're a long way behind at this point. Gets his sense in Bufalon, which is a real stroke of luck because Pig Knight's able to outspeed him and slam the Bash Buffalo with Brick Break. Although it doesn't knock out Bufalon, it does soften him up a bit before an Earthquake takes down Pig Knight. We're now down to three and Crocodile is badly poisoned, so this battle's really getting away from us. We send in Livani, who darts in close to strikes with X Scissor, scoring us another knockout. Getsis brings out Electros next, and Livani attacks again with X Scissor, which shakes the Electro type. The Eel takes full advantage of Livani being in close, though, firing a four times effective flamethrower that incinerates the nurturing Pokemon and takes us down to two. We call Crocodile back into battle next, who crunches down on Electros, knocking out the Electro type and making it a two on two. Seismitoad is gets his penultimate Pokemon, and after taking a crunch from Crocodile, he sends a muddy water crashing into him, leaving us with only Scraggy, who's really up against it. As soon as he enters the battle, he's shaken by an earthquake, but gliding across the debris, Scraggy gets in close and finishes off Seismitoad with a high jump kick. Moxie gives him an attack boost, but when Getsis sends out Bisharp, the Dark and Steel type strikes first with X Scissor. Somehow, Scraggy, battered and bruised, manages to make his way to his feet and connect with a high jump kick that annihilates Bisharp, handing us the win. 11 hit points to his name, Scraggy is the last Pokemon standing, having come through a 2 on 1 against Seismitoad and Bisharp. And that's it! We've beaten Pokemon White with Ash's team, which feels pretty surprising. Crocodile was obviously a major player late on, but honestly, I think Scraggy is the MVP. Every time he was called upon, he showed up big time. I fully approve of Ash's inability to evolve most Pokemon. It makes things more interesting for me at least. Okay, this one really got away from me. This video is long. It's gonna take me quite a while to figure out everything for 6th and 7th gen because I'll need a modded DS, and now probably isn't the best time to sort that out, but it will happen eventually. Until then, if you've sat through this whole thing, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.